is always good. I'll introduce you, Josh. Yes. The long haired hippie. The long haired yeah. hippie from San Francisco, yeah. Um, so our next speaker is Josh Burgess, uh, Postgres core team member and SF Pug leader. Correct? Yeah. Yes. Uh, fellow Pug leader. And he's going to talk about Postgres in the cloud. This is going to be awesome. Yay. Yep. Hi. Howdy, y'all. I, I get to say that I lived in Texas for eight years, so I can say howdy, y'all. As a matter of fact, if I'd written this talk before I left San Francisco, I would have brought my cowboy hat. Um, but it, the so I did, however, remember to wear my Heroku shirt. So so we're set on that account. So how many people here are running something on Amazon Web Services? Yeah, that's most of the people. How many people here are running Postgres on Amazon Web Services? That's pretty good. Okay. So some of this is not going to be new to you, but hopefully some of the ways of thinking about it will be new to you. Um, and you might not have explored all of the options, particularly since one of them is relatively new. So um, let's start out, first of all, um, and this is an important thing for thinking about this, what is AWS? Well, we have, how I earn my living is I'm a consultant. Um, probably about 60% of our clients run on AWS or run some major part of the infrastructure on in AWS. So I ask them, what is AWS? Well, they say it's basically magic, <laughs> right? <laughs> Jeff Bezos harnessed a whole herd of unicorns and he drives them around and they fart rainbows and those power a bunch of giant disk drives that store all of our stuff in the cloud, right? And that's why we can have servers that are infinitely fast and scale infinitely horizontally for free. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, you know, at least if you listen to the marketing people, and we actually find that a lot of the decision makers at our clients spend a lot of time listening to the Amazon marketing people. So we don't try to contradict them anymore because it's not worth it. Now, what Amazon is, it's just a bunch of servers, right? A bunch of servers. This is. Um, I think this is the California data center, it might be Oregon. Um, so there's a bunch of servers with virtualization software um, on all of them and a whole bunch of shared storage and a great API with all kinds of stuff. Um, and this is the real attraction, right? You don't care about this. What you care about is the stuff. All of the stuff that you would have had to build yourself otherwise and then Amazon will rent you for a price that looks like a few pennies an hour, yeah. but tends to add up to a whole lot more at the end of the month. Yeah. Um, the, um, and a terrific API to help you manage all of this stuff. And that's why people are on it, um, is all of this awesome stuff. So the great things about running stuff in AWS, number one is really fast deployment. I'm gonna show you a bunch of performance tests that I ran on the various AWS services, you know, where you can run Postgres and that sort of thing. And I set all of these up yesterday um, in a couple of hours, ran a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I've actually left them running so I can actually show them off. But, but I mean, really, you know, compared to, if you think about it, if you had to actually buy a physical server, you'd order the server from, you know, uh, from Supermicro or whatever. You'd wait two weeks for it to arrive, right? Then you'd send it off, you'd check it out and you'd install the OS and all the other things and you'd ship it off to the hosting center. And you know, sometime about three months after the purchase decision, you would have an actual server you could use. Um, as opposed to roughly 90 seconds. Um, so I, that's the big difference. And that means that you can scale stuff out, right? You know, I used to have only two replicas. Now I actually need 15 replicas because we're getting lots of read traffic. And that takes me, oh, you know, 20 minutes to do. Um, and um, given the current, given that Silicon Valley has been vacuuming up all of the ops staff they can get their hands on, um, ops staff are in short supply. It's the perpetual motion machine of cloud services, right? The cloud services companies hire all the ops staff, then you can't hire ops staff, and then you move to the cloud because you can't hire ops staff. <laughs> so, and then they need more ops staff. staff to run the cloud. So. It's great if you happen to own a cloud services company. Yeah. 
um, the, um, and for the rest of us. But you know, the thing is that even at a minimum level, you can cut down on your ops headcount for a large operation because you're no longer wrangling hardware and a lot of the OS you know, stuff. You can't eliminate your need for ops staff. But like, say if you were, had a reasonably medium large thing where running it all with your own hardware, you would have had to have eight people. You now might be able to get by with four or five. Um, and that's obviously a big deal. Now, the bad things are low system resources. Your standard Amazon, like the servers I'm going to show you, I'm talking about 15 gigabytes of RAM, four cores. I don't think I can actually buy a piece of hardware that has specs that low unless I start buying mobile hardware yeah. right now. Um, so we're talking about the hardware cap the, the virtualized hardware capabilities of an Amazon, you know, of an AWS server are equivalent to what was state of the art six years ago. I think the phone that just bought had those specs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, come to think of it, right, yeah, I think so. So um, the other thing is that all of this data center stuff doesn't come for free. Amazon has a huge staff. They just hired all the ops people in Silicon Valley, um, or actually in Amazon's case, all of the ops people in the state of Washington, um, and in Silicon Valley and in North Carolina. And so all those people have to be paid, which means that there is obviously a premium for them on top of the cost of hosting that you will pay. Um, and security, and I'm not going to go into security in depth because security in the cloud is its own at least one hour talk. Um, just say that being on a virtualized environment in the cloud gives attackers more vectors to attack you on and therefore more vectors that you must defend yourself on. Um, I thought I had a slide here. And the really bad part, the ugly part is everything is shared. So um, and particularly where you notice that sharing is in network and I.O. slash storage. Um, and kind of in CPU because of this thing called CPU stealing in the virtualization world. In other words, the performance of your virtual servers depends on somebody else whom you don't know and will never personally come in contact with, depends on their peak load. Or, as my coworker Christoph likes to put it, sharing is not caring. Um, all oh, right, this is the security slide that I wanted. Sorry, I got that out of order. Um, more attack vectors. A lot of you may have heard about this. Um, as an example of your increased attack service, they failed to adequately password protect their Amazon console. Um, somebody held the company hostage when they refused to pay ransom. He pretty much erased their entire business because their backups were in Amazon too. Um, so... Um, they're, they're gone now. Code Spaces does not exist anymore as a business. Um, so anyway, so some general tips regardless of the solutions I'm going to talk about here. Uh, number one, instances are ephemeral. That is, every virtual machine you have is called an instance in Amazon lingo, if you weren't familiar with this. And they are ephemeral, as in Amazon reserves the right to restart or sometimes make them vanish on you if they have to. Now, they obviously don't do that a lot because they would lose all the customers if they did. But it does happen on a regular enough of basis that if you are running stuff on AWS and you don't have some form of reasonably frequently updated redundancy, um, then I hope that you have resumes prepared for your next job now. Um, next thing is that even within the fairly low ball spec you have in virtual machines, the actual performance of those virtual machines is less than real hardware with the same specs would be because it's a virtualized container and all of that virtualization comes with overhead and that overhead comes out of your performance. It's not on top of it. Um, you know, and like I said, again, everything is shared and materially what everything is shared means um, is that the actual resource availability and performance is erratic. Mm -hmm. That is, it's not just slow, because in a lot of ways, it would be easy to deal with something that was predictably slow, but it can be unpredictably slow. That is, your I.O. can be 200 megabytes per second, well, not on Amazon, 100 megabytes per second, you know, 95% of the time, but the other 5% of the time when you get into one of these peak load gluts, it suddenly slows down to two megabytes per second or zero megabytes per second. And you can't predict when this will be. 
So these are, are the big AWS things. So now we're going to go into the individual solutions. Now, for a good shootout, for a good shootout, we need to have more than just two parties. Two parties is just a showdown. But to have a good shootout, we need to have at least three. So we got three here. We've got the gunslinger, which is our roll your own option. We have the rancher, which is RDS, Amazon Relational Database Service, and the dandy, which is Heroku. <laughs> so let's talk about the gunslinger right now. Gunslinger is devil may care. Um, he's cheap, he rolls into town, he's got a couple of six guns and not really anything else. Um, and he's going to set up his own EC2 server from scratch on a container. So here's how we do the gunslinger. We create an EC2 instance, we install Postgres and a whole bunch of other tools on it. We configure PostgreSQL, um, and then we have a PostgreSQL server. There are some advantages to this. One is, um, I'll do some costing and I'll show you this is the cheapest option. It's highly configurable. Anything that you know how to install on a virtual server, you can install. Anything you want to change the configuration of, you want to install a Postgres fork, you want to install whatever extensions, you know, different versions of Postgres, you want to run 8.3 for some insane reason, you can do it. Um, the, um, and so that's the big advantage. But there are some disadvantages. Number one, you're still doing all the administration, right? Installation, backup redundancy, updates, operating system updates, troubleshooting kernel problems with virtualization. Wouldn't mention it if I hadn't had to do it. <laughs> um, uh, and you're going to have to do configuration. That's not, it's not optional, right? You can't say, okay, well, I'll assume this is mostly correct and, and fine tune the configuration later. There's no configuration. You've got to do it from scratch. And so if you're looking at this from perspective of how much ops time do I need, in the role your own option, you haven't really eliminated the majority of your ops time. You've eliminated the minority of your ops time that you would have spent dealing with hardware and getting stuff racked. Mm -hmm. But the majority of your ops time, which is still configuration management, you would not have eliminated. Does anyone maintain a good Postgres uh, image? I haven't found one. And it, you know, I mean, part of it is a little easy to set up. Okay. Um, the, um, I mean, I think Enterprise DB has a set of them, but I haven't actually tried them. Um, and that brings up one of the advantages, one of the bits of stuff that you have in EC2, which is AMIs. AMIs are awesome. And AMI lets you say, take an Amazon virtual machine and say, hey, this is actually a template. And I'm going to save a copy of it so I can stamp out a whole bunch of virtual servers that look just like that. Um, and you use Amazon to say, hey, I want a server that looks just like that, but I want to add 100 gigabytes of disk space to it. You know? And that's something that's much easier to do on a virtual machine than doing it with real hardware. Um, the, um, and so I do this thing all the time where uh, we had go through successive versions of AMIs that represent a customer's platform because that is so much faster to deploy even than using something like Puppet to install the software they need. Um, and then you've got this whole host of other services, all that Amazon stuff, which is all on the same network and kind of designed to in integrate together with a caching service and a virtual DNS service and S3 storage and a whole bunch of other things that you can make use of. Um, now, one of the things you have to do when you, when you create a new virtual machine on Amazon, you have to pick an instance type. And Amazon has this constantly changing menu of different sort of instance types that have different combinations of RAM and CPU and other things. Um, the general purpose ones are the M series. Um, we're now in iteration three, so it's M3. Um, and then if you really know that you're really CPU bound, but you don't need a lot of memory or storage, then the C1s have more cores without increasing the other attributes. And we have those other things, right? Is that we can increase the RAM without increasing the other attributes, and we can increase the storage, the instant storage speed um, and quantity without increasing the other attributes. Um, in, interestingly, in terms of cost, these actually happen to be a sort of escalating hierarchy of how much they cost you. Um, the storage ones costing the most to the point where um, I would actually seriously recommend anybody who's looking at an i-series should seriously consider moving off Amazon just from a cost perspective. Um, so, in general, uh, most of the time you'd be using the M-series um, if you don't have a specific use case in mind or if you don't know what your usage pattern is. Um, you want to get enough RAM. The ideal thing is, um, and we'll get into this with storage, is you want to get enough RAM to cache your whole database if that's reasonably possible. So that is, you know, 
if you have, happen to have a database that's like 30 gigabytes in size, it is totally worth it to go for that 2x large server so that you can cache the whole database because it will be a night and day difference in performance versus not quite fitting the whole database. So you're saying 30 gigabyte databases get 32 gigs of memory? Yeah, ideally, you know, 60 gigabytes, but because the problem is that there's, there's overhead and memory gets used for other things and stuff gets bumped out. But um, the, um, so I mean, that's, you know, that, that's number one, is that actually materially, because of the way that Amazon Web Services work, the primary determinant of performance is how does the amount of RAM that you have relate to the size of your database. Um, and only if your database is so large it couldn't possibly fit in RAM do other considerations kick in. Um, now, talking about storage. So Amazon has two kinds of storage for servers. One is instant storage. And instant storage is storage that is wired to the rack of Blade servers that actually represent hold your virtual machines. Um, and instant storage is guaranteed to go away if your instance disappears for some reason, including an Amazon mandated restart. Um, so basically, if you're storing stuff in instant storage, it better be backed up or replicated somewhere else. Um, actually, that's true with anything on Amazon. It better be backed up or replicated somewhere else. Um, so your primary option, though, however, because it's actually in the same rack, the instant storage tends to be lower latency than Amazon's primary storage option, which is something called EBS, which stands for Elastic Black Block Storage. <coughs> now, Elastic Block Storage is stored on central giant storage units that are shared by hundreds of machines. Um, this is a little bit more optimized, but it's also a lot more heavily shared, so it tends to be more erratic. And it is a greater network distance, so it tends to be a much higher latency. And by, and, and by higher latency, I mean between 70 milliseconds and two seconds, depending on the level of competition there is for that resource. So it is really significant levels of latency. Um, that means that if you are going to put, however, one of the primary reasons we didn't put stuff in EBS is that unless you go for an I-series, the instant storage is very limited in size. Now, one of the nice things is with all of the third generation Amazon machines, they're now offering this option of SSD instant storage, which you want to take. There's no good reason not to take it. Um, the, um, so you can do that as one of your thing if your database will fit within that instant storage. If your database won't fit within that instant storage, then you have to use EBS. If you can use EBS, you need to pay extra for the provisioned IOPS option. Um, because um, the, um, even though provisioned IOPS, and I'll tell you, doesn't mean what you think it, it means. Um, Amazon provision IAPS does put you on a better class of storage in those EBS storage units. And so overall performance is going to be better. However, um, keep in mind that the Amazon default storage is roughly equivalent to about 1,000 IOPS on average. So if you're going to go for provision IOPS, you need to be going for a level of 1,000 or higher. Um, one mistake we've seen a lot of clients do is they get provision IOPS and then they like order like 400. And I'm like, my laptop can do 400 IOPS. Is America can do better than that? Um, so um, now there are other storage combinations, but you don't want to use them for a database. These are the these are the two options that make sense for a database, unless you just really don't care about performance at all. Uh, now, one important thing to realize is that provisioned IOPS does not mean throughput. First of all. An IOP is a single read or a single write. And because of some of the ways that Amazon uses their storage, if you do things like an index lookup, every row you retrieve becomes a single read. So if you have 2,000 provisioned IOPs and you happen to do a huge index lookup, you are actually metered to 2,000 rows per second, which is not really that good. Um, um, the one thing that Amazon does guarantee for provision IOPS is that you will never get more than 10% higher than the level you've paid for. <laughs> but you could get lower. Uh, but like I said, it is worth it because they put you on a better class of EBS unit if you order provisioned IOPS. And those units are slightly less heavily shared. So stuff to set up. Uh, you want to back up. Um, and your best option there is use the Wally open source tool to back up to S3. Amazon does guarantee the redundancy of S3, and they have yet to fail on that promise. 
Um, so, because S3 actually gets copied off between Amazon data centers. Um, so even in the great East outage, they did not lose people's data. Um, uh, replication is not optional, really, if you're running it yourself. Um, well, it's not optional. You can do one of those two things. Continuous backup to S3, if recovery time is not really important to you, that is, if you've got like a two or three hour recovery window for a failure, continuous backup to S3 is fine. Replication otherwise, and if you do replication, please replicate to a different availability zone. And basically each of Amazon's data centers is divided up between availability zones. The reason why you replicate to a different availability zone is if you don't pick a different availability zone, your replica could be on the same physical machine or on the same storage unit as your master. In which case any Amazon hardware failure that takes out your master will also take out your replica. Um, uh, you need to monitor for instance failure, you need to secure your instance, um, SSL connections, uh, dis very restrictive configurations of pghpa.conf, that sort of thing. Some basic configuration tips, lower random page cost because the way Amazon storage works, a uh, seek and a scan are really not very different at all. Um, some people actually recommend even more aggressive than this at 1.1, but somewhere 1.1 to 1.5. Uh, increase wall buffers to deal with the storage latency. Move stats to a temp directory. Um, again, storage latency. And if you can afford to lose a couple seconds of data, then turn synchronous commit off. That'll help you a lot. So, set up a performance test here. Uh, what did I set up here? Um, this is, so let's look at our gunslinger. Um, by the way, here's all the Amazon stuff. And here is actually our gunslinger. And so this is an M3 extra large unit, which means that it has four cores and 15 megabytes of RAM. Um, I gave it 75 gigabytes of provisioned IOP storage with 2000 IOPs. Um, I, and I and set it up to run a PG bench. Um, I wanted to also run the new uh, TCC TP, uh, TPCC JS benchmark, but I couldn't get it working in time. Uh, but I did do a PG bench. So um, one replica, uh, but I didn't actually do any load balancing. I just wanted to do a replica because you would have a replica on Amazon. Um, and then we did a scale 1500 PG bench database. And I specifically did a database that was slightly larger than RAM because I wanted to show the differences in performance. And when you really see the differences in performance is when the database is larger than RAM. Now when the database is much larger than RAM, performance goes in the toilet. Um, but I wanted to show a sort of realistic <coughs> level of performance. Obviously, if you're lucky enough to have a database that's three gigabytes in size, you can do almost anything you want. But most of us are not that lucky. And so then I did 10 minutes of read, write, and read only tests um, over the course of about seven hours. Um, did these three times because again, oversharing problem. And since Amazon is oversharing, your performance from minute to minute and hour to hour will vary. So I wanted to sort of get this average. Uh, and we're doing four threads in 16 sessions. So 16 connections to Postgres. So our performance for the gunslinger is actually pretty good. That wasn't too bad. Um, averaged out about 1,100 read-write transactions per second and 2,500 read transactions. That's not bad, a lot of applications could live within that. I mean, I've seen some really busy, popular applications that didn't go that high. So that's not too bad. Um, the erratic nature of it, I didn't actually manage to capture one of those times when performance goes to zero. Um, but the erratic nature of it uh, can be a little troublesome, but, but that is completely respectable. So let's look at how much that's gonna cost us. Um, so uh, about 30 cents an hour, then we gotta pay for EBS. Then we're gonna pay for the provision IOPS. And then of course we have a replica that has the same configuration. So that's gonna be about 800 a month plus mis miscellaneous charges that Amazon always manages to tack on. One of your big problems with Amazon is the unpredictability of how much it's actually going to cost you. Um, because you can never account for all of the things. Oh, we've got the inner zone network transfer charge. It's like, it's like AT&T, you know? There's always all these miscellaneous things in your bill every month. The, um, so now I was going, hmm, that's kind of pricey. Could we make that cheaper? Well, if we decide that having a, re a recovery time from failure of an hour or two 
um, of an hour is acceptable, then we can do away with the replica and just have continuous backup to S3. And this is our cheaper gunslinger. So our single gun gunslinger here, he's cheaper, he's only got one gun. Um, and that's only about $400 and change per month. Um, and we could lower that cost further by, if we knew we were going to have this database for 12 months or whatever, we get a reserved instance which chops about 20 or 30% off that cost. Um, so that is our cheaper gunslinger. So, yes? Um, no, it's actually not a way to do it, is you actually get multiple block stores and you raid them. Uh, at least for a PG bench test. I mean, if you're actually doing some kind of data warehousing, then it kind of might work. Um, but I think materially you'd be better off yeah. getting an I instance and get instant storage. What? Yeah, the idea is basically to distribute the reads over multiple block stores. Yeah, but the problem is that because you don't know which of the block stores in any given second is going to be the slowest, you end up waiting on whichever one is the slowest. Um, the, um, because you don't have any way to, you know, unless you were to use an actual sharded fork of Postgres like Postgres XL and have redundant copies of each piece of data and distribute them over the course of that and take whichever one came back first. Then you could actually get some benefit from that. But at that point, you look at the amount of money you're spending and you, you know, go, you know, we could actually like get a rack in a real data center for this cost. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, so, second option, the rancher. The relational database service. So, um, and you know, he's a man of property. He's you know a little bit more official and a little bit more proper than, than our gunslinger, but he knows how to defend himself, and he's kind of right in the middle here. And so the question is, is this a happy medium or the undesirable middle? Well, let's see. Well, first of all, for our ranching, how do we do our ranching thing? We go to Amazon Web Services RDS. Um, we choose PostgreSQL. Uh, we set the instance size and storage, which is a more limited set of options than you get with EC2. And we launch it, and then we connect over port 5432. So if we want to actually look at this, so here is our RDS instance. Um, I discovered one of the, the things, actually, one of the limitations in RDS is once you've created it, you can't rename it. Because um, I was going to rename it Rancher, and I discovered you can't actually do that. Um, so it's still called RDS test 2. But here we are. Um, I've got it in the availability zone, US West 1C. Um, this is, uh, again, M3X large because I wanted them to be comparable. Um, and, doo -doo 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 -doo. and I've got this provision with 200 gigabytes of storage with 2,000 items. Well, why did I get so much extra storage? Well, the answer is that on RDS, Amazon forces you to buy a certain amount of storage if you want a certain amount of IOPS. Why they do this in RDS when it's not required in EC2 is, is not clear to me, but that is how it is set up. Um, so the, uh, my guess is it's to increase your cost. Yeah. Um, the, um, so, um, and, you know, and so we've got all of this, you know, we've got all that set up, and then once you have all of that set up, now, one of the interesting things, oh, here, where are we? So one of the interesting things about this is now we're getting into database as a service, right? EC2 is platform as a service, right? I have a virtual Linux that I'm running stuff on top of, right? Now, I've got database as a service, which means I don't actually have a shell to log into. I connect over port 5432 and I log into the PSQL console. And here's my PSQL console on that instance. Um, you know, and I've got my usual PSQL things. Um, the, um, but an important thing, one of the important things is um, I'm not actually the super user. Amazon doesn't give you super user. Does that mean that you can't change configuration options on your Postgres? You can, but you have to use the Amazon API to do it. So. So, advantages here, uh, we just simplified our deployment. Um, Amazon manages updates for us, it manages uptime, it manages restarting the database and failing it over if you configured it with multi-zone failover automatically. Um, and as long as you're using the URL that they supply, your applications will be able to reconnect right after the failover. Um, 
they, you can configure it with double redundancy that is, as in multi-zone warm standby. So they have a standby that they maintain. You can't connect to it, but you can fill over automatically to it. Um, and they have a service where you can snapshot the database to S3 on some period of time that you define. Um, usually, it, by default, it's once a day. There are some disadvantages, though. Uh, number one, they limit the extensions you can install. Um, again, they haven't given you a super user. And because they haven't given you a super user, they can't give you an extension that would allow you to have rights on the host system. Um, so, for example, no PL Python, because PL Python is untrusted, which means that we can't limit its rights. No PLR, for that matter, for the same reason. Um, and basically, no extensions that the Amazon people have not pre built. They give you this ability to install extensions as a non super user, as an Amazon feature, um, and they give you a whole bunch of extensions, um, but it's not all the ones that are out there. And maybe not the one you want to use. And here's the important limitation, no replication. So they do not support Postgres binary replication, which means you can't have read-only replicas and load balance to them. The warm standby thing they do is based on Amazon's own DRBD type thing, uh, which will become important later. No shell access, no super user. And importantly, you still have to configure Postgres, though, because it comes out of the box with a sort of default configuration which is somewhat less default than the default Postgres package configuration, but is still not really very well configured. So you still have to go into, um, we go into here and we go into, let's go ahead and modify. Um, and you know, you have to go into, you can do all of these sorts of things and configure. Um, actually, let me show you the, the settings thing, because actually, if, um, obviously, you would want to script this, like I would use the Python API rather than using the GUI. The GUI is really painful um, because, like, if we go into the parameter groups, what you do is you manage these things through parameter groups. And so if we wanted to actually modify the parameter groups, then we actually go through here, which is a form with all of Postgres's 225 configuration variables in alphabetical order. And they've disabled the ability to use shortcuts like calling something 11 gigabytes. Instead, you have to compute how much it is in bytes. Um, so you really, want to use, you really want to use the coding API if you're going to be doing this. But the important thing about this you know, as sort of a takeaway is that they haven't eliminated your configuration overhead. Now, you don't have to install Postgres anymore. And you don't have to apply updates to it because they take care of that. But you still have to configure it. And you have to configure security and everything else. Hey, yeah? Yes. Yeah. So if, you, if they don't have one that you're interested in, let them know. They want to know what yeah. people want. And yeah. they figure out some important ones, like the UID ones. And yeah. Um, yeah, I'm going to say, so the, if you actually look at, um, oh, one. one. Is the list for Python ones, or are they the same thing? They still haven't added a ton that are pretty common. Well, that's pretty, the Python ones obviously are very risky. So for example, so here's the list of extensions they make available. Now, one of the ones that they just recently added was PG Stat Statements, which, as far as I'm concerned, is a requirement for any cloud-based Postgres because you don't have you have a restricted access to the Postgres log on Amazon. Um, that is, there's ways that you can get the log to feed out so you can download it, but you can't change all of the logging options that you want. Some of the logging options you can't change. Um, particularly, you can't change the format into a format that PG Badger, for example, will read, which is really annoying. Um, so you really need PG stack statements to have any kind of insight into what kind of queries you're running at all. So at least they've added that, and they've taken fee By the way, the Amazon RDS team has been very responsive to people in the Postgres community. They've been really terrific at accepting feedback and fixing the things that can be easily fixed. Uh, but there are some things that are not easy for them to fix, and I wouldn't hold your breath on those things, like PL Python, for example. Um, so. Um, and to RDS, they've added tighter integration to some of the AWS services that are supposed to work with databases. So things like um, they're caching their Redis slash memcache compatible caching layer. You know, is there's this sort of automatic integration with it um, 
that requires less setup than if you set it up yourself on EC2. Um, you know, and the S3 snapshotting and you know, some other things that are sort of combo packs with other Amazon services. Plus, you can have regular access just like you would an EC2 to any of the other Amazon things. Uh, so some options. Um, you, you again are choosing instance types and they're the same as the EC2 instance types except it's a restricted list. As in you can no longer have the full choice of instance types, now you're sort of limited to the M3 and R3 options. Um, when they first launched it, the I3 options were available for data warehousing and they've taken those away. Um, or actually I2 options, there's no I3, sorry. But the, the high storage options were available and they've taken those away and I don't know why. Um, the, um, maybe because it was internally competing with Redshift, I don't know. Um, or maybe because, you know, well, one of the problems with the I option to begin with was it was so, it was apparently complicated enough for Amazon to set up that you couldn't get in a high storage, high storage performance RDS server unless you got a reserved instance and committed to a year. So, and I think most people weren't willing to do that and so they just gave it up. Um, again, you want to get enough RAM. Um, because of how they've set up RDS, you no longer have an instant storage option. It's all EBS storage. Um, because their failover system only works through EBS. So it's all EBS storage. Um, and so you do the provisioned IOPS. EBS without provisioned IOPS is just the kiss of death. Again, unless you happen to be lucky enough to have a database application where performance really doesn't matter. Um, now, uh, redundancy. Um, if you cannot afford to lose a full day of data, um, then you'd better take the multi-availability zone redundancy option. Um, I pretty much consider that not, not an option on RDS. You must have it. Because you can't do replication. You can't do Postgres continuous backup. The snapshotting system only works at point in time. And you can't do it any more often than once an hour. And depending on how big your database is, once an hour may not be practical. Um, so um, pretty much, you know, you need that multi-AZ and then you want to set up daily snapshots in case, you know, your database gets hacked or something, right? Um, so now the configuration, same tips as roll your own, except now you've got to work through that Amazon API to do your configuration, except that you have fewer security options because you only have the ones that are going to be compatible with doing database as a service. So you can't do things like route everything through a PG bouncer living on the same instance as Postgres or other things that you could do to make it more secure um, off of EC2. Um, now, again, we did performance. So you saw our rancher, right? Our M3 XLarge instance running RDS with our 2000 provision IOPS and that sort of thing. And I ran the same PG bench tests several times uh, over several hours. And uh, we're seeing a substantial drop in performance. Now this was actually kind of a surprise. So this was because of something somebody said to me a few months ago. Because when I tested running a standalone RDS instance, that is one without redundancy, months ago when they came out with RDS, I was like, well, the performance is basically the same as, as doing your own EC2 instance, because it really is just an EC2 instance. It's basically the same, no substantial difference. And therefore, um, and therefore, your choice of RDS versus EC2 should really just be one based on management and cost, right? Except that, again, it's not practical to run without redundancy on RDS because you can't do replication. And if you're running it with redundancy, it's dependent on Amazon's own implementation of DRBD, which does storage level replication. And storage level replication is slow. As a matter of fact, based on these scores, it is imposing something on the order of a 60% overhead. Um, so the, um, I, and I was actually, I was a little surprised by this. I mean, so much so that I ran this benchmark more times than I did on the first EC2 instance to make sure that this was realistic. And I actually killed my original RDS instance, created another one, checked that one, got the same, more or less same ballpark for scores. So this, this is what it looks like. Um, so here's our cost. Um, we need to do multi-AZ, so it's going to be 84 cents an hour. Um, and then another 246 a month for 
um, because they actually charge more on RDS for provisioned IOPS because they force you to buy more provisioned IOPS storage to get the provisioned IOPS to begin with. And so that ends up being 246 a month, so we're up to about 860 a month, plus whatever miscellaneous charges Amazon ends up tacking on. And it's slower. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah. On the other hand, what you've gotten for the extra money in sacrificing the performance is, if you've set all this up and you lose your master instance, it will fail over to the standby instance. The DNS will redirect automatically, and all that needs to happen is your applications reconnect. And you don't have to, you know, and if you set up your applications to reconnect automatically, the only way you know about it is that you get an alert from Amazon in the morning telling you that you need to set up a new standby instance. Um, and you can use those standby, one of the nice things is you can use those standby instances to do things like upgrade your EC2 instance, right? You need to allocate more storage. Well, allocate more storage in the standby instance and then fail over. Um, so, now, our third option, the dandy. He's, he's posh, he's good looking, he's stylish, he's well spoken, he's Heroku. Our, our white glove service option. <laughs> right? The Heroku is don't worry about your database, just give us your credit card. <laughs> and we'll take care of everything. So, doing the dandy, choose create database. Let's actually go ahead and do this. So, we're going to the Heroku, right? Here is, here is our dandy. Um, which I already set up and tested. But to give you an example, I'm not actually going to complete this, but um, you can see how simple it is, except my internet's being a little bit slow. Um, wow. Hey, how about some responsive design, guys? Um, the, um, so you've got five choices of size here. Um, so, you know, again, if you've noticed, the more managed the service becomes, the less options we have. So for, for Heroku, you basically have five choices of size. Uh, well, and you also have a couple of, you actually literally have seven choices. Because you have the dev, which is free for a little tiny minuscule database. Um, the basic plan for a database that's like less than a gigabyte in size. Um, and then we move up to standard, standard two, standard four. These used to have cute names. I, I think this is Salesforce's influence. They used to be named after like sushi dishes. Um, and I really liked that. You know, but I guess Salesforce bought them and they're now standardizing everything, which is kind of annoying, but whatever. Um, and one of the things you'll notice is as the capabilities of these go up, the prices escalate rather dramatically. Um, now, part of this is there's a lot of internal costing logic for Heroku. Part of this is they want to get people in at a low level and get them to escalate. And partly it's they figure if you're buying this, it's because you need it and you're going to use it. Whereas at lower levels, people are more likely to overbuy. Um, so um, anyway, what we did here was standard four. And that was the reason for doing MX large on the other options was I wanted something that was directly com comparable to standard four. Okay, and that's it. That's it. You launch. Um, after it gets done launching, it gives you some login credentials, um, which are a bunch of uh, auto-generated keys. And again, this is one of those things that got less attractive with Heroku because it, so like here, you can see my PSQL line. They used to give you auto-generated keys that were generated on a fun formula where you would get like uh, Feisty Blowfish 37 as your key, instead of these random character strings. I don't know when these random character strings started up, but I don't like them. The, um, for one thing, there's no way I could ever remember that to type it, whereas I can remember Feisty Blowfish 37. Um, the, um, so anyway, but, and again, like RDS, once it's spun up, you don't have a shell or anything. You just connect to it over PSQL. Um, and, and there you go, and you connect um, over a public network. So, um, advantages for Heroku. They manage everything, updates, backups, availability, configuration, um, you know, all of that is done by them. Um, so, if you're really looking for an option that allows you to lay off all of your ops staff, <laughs> then this is the one. Um, the, um, I mean, not realistically when you get to a certain size, um, but, 
um, if, if, you're, if your whole goal in moving to the cloud is really to eliminate op staff, this is your end point. Um, and Heroku is a bunch of Heroku only features, which are called add-ons, that allow you to tack on various services and other things, in addition to having access to the full panoply of Amazon services, since Heroku is running on Amazon. So you've got Amazon plus the services that are Heroku only. Disadvantages, no configurability at all. You simply do not have access to the configuration. Um, they're assuming you're running a Rails or Python web app because that's who their primary clientele is. Mm -hmm. um, that's how they've configured it for performance. Um, one of the things that I actually discovered doing my performance testing is I can't configure what availability zone my database instance is in. As a matter of fact, I can't even find out what availability zone it's in. Um, the, um, I, you have limited extensions, again, like RDS. They have about the same number, although not, interestingly enough, exactly the same set of extensions. Um, you know, like I said, as you expand your capacity, their costs go up with sort of a graph. And again, no super user, no shell access if you want to do any power user things, extensions that are available in source only, any of that other stuff. No replication. Uh, actually, <clears throat> no, that's not true. Amazon, uh, Amazon, not a, well, Amazon, but Heroku has a bunch of nifty features they've added to Postgres, the Heroku platform. One of them is this thing called data clips. And data clips are awesome because they are materialized views available over a URL. So if you want everybody to get update data on the game scores for your little league, then you can create that as a data clip, give people a URL to point to, and anytime they load that URL, they'll get whatever data at whatever refresh interval you've set for the data clip. Like and CSV you can restrict or access or to them as well. Yeah? What, what does it come back? Is it CSV or? Um, I think you have some options for that. Um, the, um, I think I've gotten it as JSON most of the time. Oh, okay. um, you can also get it as HTML. Um, the um, second thing is they have replicas available. Unlike RDS, you do have replicas. They call them followers. Um, so they simplify setting up replication to be create follower. Um, so to, to be a point and click or single command API, if you're using the API um, thing. Um, so to create followers and that sort of thing. About 20 extensions, their add-ons, and then access to all AWS servers. Um, and our options are we've got our five sizes. And that's it. So performance. Um, again, trying to be comparable. So this is server four, which is a 15 gigabyte server, about equivalent to an MX large. Um, and our performance drops again. Read write is two, about 250 transactions per second. Uh, read only is 610 transactions per second. Now, I was surprised by this, um, given the performance engineering that Heroku has put into this. I was expecting them to do better than RDS. Um, now, however, I dug into this and I realized a couple of problems. Number one is because I couldn't determine the availability zone of the, because um, I couldn't determine the availability zone of the Heroku server, I may have been running the PG Bench server in a different availability zone. Whereas for the other two options, I was running the PG Bench server in the same availability zone. Um, so I may have been running in a different availability zone because I couldn't tell. Um, and that would add to latency, which would decrease my TPS. The other bigger thing is, I dug into the technical details of the different Heroku sizes. And one of the other things they limit is all of their servers are now on provisioned IOPS. And the lower end servers are on lower levels of provisioned IOPS. For the server four, it is 500 provisioned IOPS. Whoa. And what did I say about the comparison to like regular storage? So, so, and the thing is, this is a lower score than they were getting when I tested them like two years ago. And the reason for that is the move to provisioned IOPS because 500 provisioned IOPS is actually worse than using regular EBS storage in terms of your real throughput. Um, and that's the meter, and that's why the read-only score is so much lower, because those are read IOPS, because I have a database that's slightly larger than RAM. Josh, yeah? Do they uh, promise uh, better predictability about that performance? Uh, I mean, they're running on top of Amazon. They can't. What's that? They're running on top of Amazon. They have no way to promise that. Okay. Um, if they did promise it, they'd be lying. Um, so, 
However, what they do give you better predictability out is cost. As in, for that server four, it's 750 a month, no random Amazon extras, unless I use some of Amazon's other services, but no random extra Amazon extras, none of these calculation things, none of, you know. I mean, basically, calculating the cost for the other two options took me like, you know, 15, 20 minutes for each option. This one, there, 750 a month. So they do give you predictability of cost. Um, now, if we want the replica, that's another 750 a month. Um, however, the replica is maybe optional because what Heroku does do automatically is continuous backup to S3. So they guarantee you not losing more than an hour of data. And in practice, it's more like minutes um, if you lose the instance. Um, even in the great US East outage, they did not lose more than an hour of data for any customer. So we do have some other options in AWS um, that I'm just going to mention in passing. Um, Enterprise DB has some AWS-y stuff. They have Postgres plus Cloud, which in my experience is a lot like RDS. It has a more Postgres-oriented management uh, console that has some performance stuff and that sort of thing that RDS doesn't have. Um, but it doesn't have as nice of an a, a programmer API as RDS does. So there's very trade-off there. They just recently launched this NoSQL thing, which is some sort of NoSQL compatibility layer on top of Postgres 9.4 beta. Um, but, you know, I've read the marketing copy and I actually, it's not publicly available, so I don't know what it actually does. Um, uh, Redshift, uh, this belongs to Amazon. It's a Postgres 8.2 fork, used to be something called Paracel. It's an AWS service. It's for data warehousing only. Um, but it is an option if what you're doing is data warehousing and might be a better option than trying to do data warehousing on EC2. Um, other clouds. Believe it or not, there are other clouds. Um, as a matter of fact, several other clouds specifically have Postgres products. Uh, Red Hat OpenShift has a Postgres service. Um, Cloud Foundry has a Postgres service. And GoGrid has a Postgres service. Um, so those are all have Postgres service options. And of course, you can run Postgres in any cloud you want to. But I mentioned those three because they specifically have Postgres as a service in some form. Now, so let's actually line up our shootout results in a comparison. Now, I will warn you, these are not all directly comparable because as I have shown you, you don't get exactly the same stuff with each option. Um, but um, we can line these up right here. We've got you know, these sort of comparisons in terms of uh, how many transactions per second. And just to give you a comparison, I took a cheap server that I happened to have lying around and ran the same benchmarks in it. Well, more or less the same. The cheap server happened to have 64 gigabytes of RAM. And so I increased the size of the database to make it not fit in RAM in order to have a valid comparison. Um, the, um, but, I mean, to give you an idea, remember when I said Amazon costs more in the long haul? This really shows you how it costs more in the long haul. If we take the cost of a server, so this is a 1U dual uh, socket 12 core machine with 64 gigabytes of RAM um, and three disks, one spinny disk and two SSDs and no RAID controller, um, well, dumb RAID controller, so no battery back RAID cache which is important for these scores. Um, costs about $1,800 total, kitted out. Um, then amortize that over 24 months with the racking costs and network costs, and you get roughly about 360 a month for that. Um, which when you compare it, well, 180 a month for the one server, 360 if you want two of them to have replication. Um, so, you know, obviously the upfront cost is lower with these options, but the long-term cost is actually lower owning your own hardware provided that you can manage that hardware. Mm -hmm. so yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, basically, this actually probably should have been over here because this is the other end, right? This is the, the high staffing, low external cost option. The, um, so, and then I decided I would go ahead and calculate something. So this is the price per read-write transaction per second for the combination of options that gives you failover with a less than one hour restore time. Oh. Um, so in the case of Heroku, I did not require you to have a replica, 
because I know I can get less than one hour restore time from Heroku's backup system. But for the roll your own option, I did require a replica because otherwise I don't have that. Um, the, um, so, and, and that just makes an interesting comparison. Like I said, these packages are not exactly the same, but it gives you some sort of order of magnitude ideas <laughs> that, you know, hey, you are actually paying a lot more to have database as a service yeah. on a how much throughput can it do. Now, that may not matter to you because the truth is, if you're really only doing 100 transactions per second, then you don't care what your database is capable of. Um, the, um, you only care if you need to do more than that. So, questions in the couple of minutes we have left. Did you look at Roku's point in time pullback? Do you know how that works? Um, yeah, it's all based on Postgres. It's all based on Postgres's point in time recovery. Um, and that, you know, I mentioned the Wall-E project. If you're doing well your own, they wrote Wall-E, and so that's what they're using. Um, and so it just puts everything in S3, and then you'll use the rollback from S3. Now, when, when you tell it to roll back, it's not actually rolling your stuff back. It's spinning up another instance and reloading it to the point that you asked it for. Other questions? Um, yeah? Well, so the clouds obviously have the advantage of if you're only doing this for a limited time, you only pay for a month's worth. So yeah. Other advantages to the cloud. Well, not instantly, um, but you know, within minutes to hours, yes. Um, now, part of it depends on your ability to. Uh, first of all, if you've been a, to horizontally scale your application, then obviously you can spin up a bunch of replicas or a bunch of new database servers relatively quickly. Um, if you haven't done anything about horizontally scaling your application, then you're facing moving stuff to a bigger instance. Um, which would mean some sort of a replication or standby swap. So if you're doing well your own, what you would do is you would create a new replica on a larger EC2 instance. When the replica caught up with the master, you would fail over, right? And then you just reroute everything to that. Um, obviously, if you're doing that at the time when you're already under peak load, that's going to be problematic. Um, you can do the same thing with the RDS standby. And that's going to be a little bit easier because the way their standby system works, it doesn't really care about the load on the master. Um, so you basically um, tell it to allocate a new standby with larger capabilities than the previous standby. So I want to move to MX, 3X large and, and start that up. Um, and we've done that with a number of clients, mostly to increase their number of provisioned IOPS, you know, because they had a, had a thousand provisioned IOPS and it turned out to be not enough. Um, and so to move it up to like say 3,000 provisioned IOPS, we did the whole create the standby with 3,000 provisioned IOPS and then fail it over. Um, the, um, uh, with Heroku, um, with Heroku they give you a point and click or single API command. Now what they're doing behind the scenes is they're starting up a replica and failing over to the replica. But you don't personally have to do any of that. You just tell them, I want to increase my package and it says, pending. And at some point you get a sort of blip in your application throughput when the failover happens and then it's just happened and you don't, you don't have to do anything else. The pricing on the Amazon, um, those, were, those instances uh, weren't reserved, right? Correct. So you could actually lower the price further. But RDS also, re also offers reserved instances. So that would also potentially lower the price as well. Um, although actually as I recall, RDS reserved instances are not available at the lower levels. They're only available at the upper levels of RDS size. Um, when I was looking at the chart that, that they had and that the discounting for a server this size was negligible. Um, and Heroku doesn't have reserved instances. I'm just going to comment about third party solutions as opposed to big players. Um, we're looking at having one for a database public access 
and cameras that I'd see in New Zealand or a bigger open source company there with Mark Kirkwood working for them. Mm -hmm. And it's costing us about 80 bucks a month for a cloud post gist post instance there. In New Zealand? Yeah. Is that being run by Catalyst? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. I, you know, look, if you're New Zealand Catalyst, is the option. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, it, and it's just a good thing that they're nice because they don't have to be. Um, <laughs> because they're the only option. Well, I was just curious about uh, where OpenShift falls into the chart. Um, I didn't have time to do a comparison of that. I mean, this was already a fair amount of time. And actually, honestly, I wasted a lot of time trying to get TPCCJS working because I wanted to prevent. Because the problem with PG Bench is that it's not, it's a micro benchmark. So it basically works out CPU and single row lookup costs and single row write costs, random write costs. So it works out certain aspects of performance, but not others. Like there's no large reads, there's no large writes, um, anything else. So TBCC would be a better workout. Um, the, um, but TBCC JS is new, nobody, I'm the first person to try to run it after Gurjeet wrote it. Um, and, and so it needs some work still. Just on that basis, knowing that sort of commercial database vendors do not let you publish benchmarks, Generally, can you publish benchmarks on the services? Um, I don't know. We'll see because I'm going to put this on my blog. The, um, I mean, my real answer is everything I did here was open source. It took me, it took me roughly a day of work time, you know, to, to do the part that I'm showing you here. So, you know, I'll just say, look, if you don't believe me, here's how I set it up. Do it yourself. Do you have other questions? Okay, well that's good, thank you.